Okay, welcome back, guys. We are going to be going over lesson 11 today, which is photography. So let's get right into it. Um, just my simple definition for photography I have here is derived from the Greek roots that means drawing with light. Um, I will let you know that will appear back on a quiz question. So um, drawing with light is the answer for what is photography. Um, Photography allows for a selection of cameras, lenses, and film, as well as composition. Um, also uh, allows for exposure that controls light and darkness. Um, photography is something that has been wanted for a very, or was wanted for a very long time, um, more than 300 years. The concept preceded the actual medium itself. Um, obviously, you know, our early paintings and drawings and so forth are um, essentially trying to do what photography accomplishes, which is to create a representational, um, totally, you know, lifelike depiction of something. Um, the first sort of roots of where photography came from is this idea of camera obscura, which is still the process itself is still used today in our modern day cameras, but it's just, you know, it's, it's uh, expanded a lot from what the original camera obscura was. Um, camera obscura was literally a dark room or it literally translated to dark room. Um, and I'm going to show you this picture here of kind of what camera obscura looks like. So um, camera obscura, let's look reference these little um, like illustrations to the right there. Um, essentially, the idea was that if you are in a so just imagine real quick wherever you're at, if you're at your house or in, at school or wherever, um, that you, there's no light coming into the space that you're in. So, um, you know, I'm in my living room right now. So I'm just imagining like the walls to be totally flat, no windows, no, um, light coming from the TV or, you know, the, um, the electric heaters or my phone or the computer or anything. It's just a totally dark room. And as we know, if there is no light that is informing the space that we are existing in, we have no perception of what the space is. So as soon as a little pinhole, like right here in this illustration is um, created, then the light starts to come through the room. And with the use of a, of a mirror, the image that's coming from the outside can be transferred upside down onto one of the walls that are the opposite wall of where the, the light hole is coming from. So we can see here how that works there. Um, this early idea um, where there's actually no like, um, like, engraved or like burning process to where like the image is actually like put onto something permanently um wasn't actually like a photo but it was really helpful for artists who were um you know drawers or painters to be able to do an outline of whatever it was they were drawing instead of having to freehand it so that that saved a lot of time in in like the early you know um kind of like development of this Later on, we start developing um, lenses and angled mirrors to ease of tracing, um, or what I just kind of talked about there, actually. And then it's not till 1826 that we see the first, um, like, actual chemical development start happening. So that's where we move on to this little image right here, um, where we have these um, smaller, you know, <laughs> dark room or um, camera obscura boxes, um, still very, you know, cumbersome and um, not something that you can just put in your pocket like we have today. But, um, you know, it made it a little bit more portable, a little bit more accessible for people to have. So the chemical development um, is used by um, using a sensitized pewter plate and exposing it to light for over eight hours. So that's why early on when we see like those early like daguerreotype photos that we'll talk about in a second, um, those photos, a lot of the time, if they're of people, they're in a very like rigid, um, you know, they're not smiling or uh, making like really any facial expressions. They're just very, you know, it's very straightforward. And that's because they had to sit for those, those photos for like hours and hours on time. Um, sometimes they would even have like braces or um, like, you know, a piece of wood even put onto their back so they wouldn't move because as soon as they start moving around, um, the, the development will capture any of that movement and the picture will become blurry. So um, we came a long way from that to having, you know, an iPhone in our pocket that we can just, you know, whip out at any time and take a picture in 10 seconds or less. Um, so the daguerreotypes that I talked about, um, they used actually, it wasn't pewter plates, but it was iodized silver plates exposed to mercury vapor and then fixed by a mineral salt solution. So very, very long process. And it wasn't on like a piece of paper that you see a, a picture being on today. Um, it, it was on a big kind of like heavy metal plate instead. Um, 
originally only stationary objects are recorded due to the very long exposure times. Um, the first figure doesn't appear until 1839. So we start to get the, um, the process a little bit quicker, but not, um, not so much that it's, you know, a comfortable thing to do. It's still very cumbersome. It's still very, you know, not a good time <laughs> to have your picture taken, but it is a lot cheaper, not, not a ton cheaper, I would say, but um, it becomes a little bit more accessible than, you know, only like kings and queens and royalty being the ones that could have their portraits painted. They can, you know, have a little bit more accessibility now. Um, so again, prior to the camera, only wealthy could have afford to have their portraits painted. Um, but portrait photography, like I said, was still pretty expensive. Um, and then we start to develop less toxic technology that makes it um, a little bit more safe to use and more accessible for others to use. Some uh, modern techniques that we see, um, the modern camera resembles traditional camera obscura, the lens collects light, image sensor collects the image upside down, and the sensor converts the light into an electric charge. So um, it's still kind of using and like, you know, leaning on those same key principles that we found, you know, almost 200 years ago now. Um, but it's, it's still, you know, it, it's, it's developed a lot. We have electricity now, we have um, all of these things that have changed to make it a lot quicker, a lot easier. Um, for a photographer with our modern cameras today, there are three important adjustments that need to be considered. Um, the focal length or the distance between the lens and the sensor, and that's how much focus the image will have. So um, if you ever have, you know, played with a DSLR camera like this one that has one of the lenses you can sort of go in and out with, um, that, that will show you how, how in focus your, your image is going to be. Um, the aperture or the f-stop is the ratio of the focal length to the size of the opening. Um, so we see that happening um, in this camera here as well. And the shutter speed determines the brightness of the resulting photo. So um, shutter speed, I would say, is, is one of the most important ones to think about. Um, so if you're, for example, like this, this example we have here of this, um, kid playing soccer for that, um, you would want a really, really fast shutter speed turned on so you could capture all the movement and it wouldn't be blurry. Um, however, if you were taking something at night where there's not, you know, as much light sort of, you know, coming in, you would want your shutter speed to be very, very slow. So it could capture all of the light that's going to come in and, um, make the picture as bright as it possibly could be. Um, sorry, I lost my place there for a second. Um, early art and photography, um, the public art or the public world kind of initially was reluctant to accept photography as a, like an art medium. Um, they more so relied on it as a mechanical device and like a, you know, advance in technology rather than an art. Um, we do start to see some early portrait photography and photographers, um, kind of leaning more into like a conceptual side of photography. Julie Margaret Cameron, um, is one of those where she was sort of using photography for storytelling and to depict like scenes from literature. Um, this is one of those scenes here. It's of um, two children, Paul and Virginia, from a popular novel at the time. Um, and yeah, so we can see here there's there's some conceptual things happening here that aren't just the regular everyday portrait photography for, you know, people to have documentation of their family. Um, from early art photography, um, we see artists like Man Ray, who um, he has these innovations of rayographs, which, as you can see here, um, I'm not sure if anyone has ever seen the um, like the cyanotype prints uh, several years ago. I mean, even even now today, even um, they're really popular in like anthropology and urban outfitters and those kinds of places for different like wall art and decoration and things. Um, but essentially, this is um, the rayographs are made by placing objects onto light sensitive paper and then exposing them to sunlight. So these are probably just like regular shapes and whatnot. Um, and then the light exposed it and sort of left the impression onto the, the paper. Um, this isn't like actual photography as the way that we think about it being the camera obscura. There's no camera or lenses and the sub subjects are sometimes unclear. But it is a way to sort of like get a, uh, a permanent um, like document or not document, but a permanent um, artifact from uh, different objects being placed on a piece of paper at a certain time and then being able to like carry that with you. Um, so photography and social change. Um, photography is huge for um, bringing awareness to things that are going on in the world. Um, 
you know, drawing and painting, as we've talked about, are really important for those early on as well. However, we have to rely and trust the um, the artist to replicate what they are seeing in a not um, like surreal or like fan fantasy type of way, and that they're actually depicting something the way that it it exists. Um, an early example I, I have of this of, uh, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm not going to know the names exactly of this, but. Um, Early on, there was an artist who went over to Africa and did drawings of um, rhinos, which people in America had, you know, no ideas what rhinos, no idea what rhinos looked like. That was a whole totally foreign thing to them. And the way that the artist depicted the rhino um, was almost like it had like armor on it. So it was, it was sort of like this, uh, this, uh, I don't know, like metal, um, like transformer type thing. Um, I don't have the drawing listed in the PowerPoint, but if you ever want to like look that up on your own, just type in like early drawings of rhinos. Um, and it's really funny what the, what the result of that is. It's not really what a rhino looks like, but what the artist perceived the, the rhino to look like. So um, that was a little tangent, but with photography for social change, um, it's really important to, to have photographers to, um, take pictures of what's going on in their generation, in their cultures, in their part of the world to help people know what's happening there. Um, it's a lot easier to feel sympathy and it's a lot easier to, you know, bring attention and call attention to something if you have a visual component to it rather than just having like a verbal dialogue about it. It sort of like brings it to life more and makes it more real to people um, and not as easily ignored. So, this is um, Jacob Riz, an early leader of photography for social change. Um, this is one of his pieces called Five Cents a Spot. And this drew attention to squalid living conditions and led to the improved housing and work safety. Um, this portrait here is, um, I believe it was from New York and some of like the, the living conditions of these people um, who were working in these factories and like weren't making enough money to, you know, afford really like food or living conditions. There was sometimes, you know, 15 or 20 people living in these small little like apartment type things, or if you'd ever even want to call them apartments. Um, but, you know, bringing attention to this and showing, you know, politicians and people who are making decisions about this, these photographs and saying, Hey, I know we're telling you this, but like, here's the evidence for it. I know that, you know, the big corporate, you know, CEO guy, it's not going to go check out these apartments himself, but I have photographs and, you know, can expose you for this. So um, I think it's really important, especially early on to, um, you know, have this kind of development and show people what's happening in places they might not find themselves normally. Um, photography is a vehicle for truth. The camera never lies. Um, I, I would argue that today because we have such, you know, we have technology that does so much more than it would, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, we can manipulate things to look like we want them to. We can crop things out. We can um, make things look like, you know, whatever we want to really. And it's, it's a photograph. So I'm always skeptical to believe, you know, what it is that I'm seeing in photography today. But, um, you know, way back when photography was, you know, that, that was the most accurate way to show something um, in its most, most authentic way. Um, this is another uh, photographer for social change, Margaret Bjork White. Um, she had the concept of photographic essays. So this sort of preceded like film um, or like video film where we could have, you know, um, like a story being shown and like, you know, recorded in a way that was uh, sequential. Um, but the photographs being taken like, you know, sequentially and um, arranged to kind of tell a story or convey a mood was a really popular way of organizing photography back in the day. Uh, we also see environmentalism um, as a really big proponent of photography for social change. Ansel Adams is an early leader of that. Um, and this is, this, is, this is very early on, but his sort of um, attention to this is a need for conservation of natural environment. Um, this is the clearing winter storm in Yosemite's National Park, California. Um, photography back in like the early 1900s and late 1800s, like this photo here, um, more so highlight highlighted like the grandeur of nature, um, kind of, you know, this relationship between nature and like city. 
um, and how, you know, looking at nature, there is a lot of symbols for spiritual life um, and transcending the conflicts of like our, you know, city, city societies that we see. It's, it's sort of a place of escapism. Whereas today's environmental photographers are more likely to focus on human impacts from, um, you know, pollution and, um, you know, uh, fossil fuels and things like that, the, the impacts of those, which still is very important because artists like Chris Steele Perkins um, will travel to places and show you things that you will not, you know, see on the everyday life like this, where um, this trash is literally just washed up on this beach here. And it just goes for like, miles and miles and miles of all of this trash that has happened to, you know, pollute this island in a way that, you know, we don't even think about. Um, you're not allowed to travel to the Marshall Islands either. So seeing photographs um, from people that have like permission to go there, um, it's really one of the only times that you will see this kind of thing. Uh, talking about pushing the limits in photography, Trevor Paglin, um, is a photographer. He's, um, probably not the kind of photographer that we'll see too much talked about in other types of like art within, or photography within art. Um, but he highlights contemporary questions about government secrecy. Um, he, uh, is really interested in kind of like, you know, seeing how far photography can go as far as like seeing things and using it as like a, um, almost like binoculars, but being able to document it in that way. Um, this is a limit telephotography. He got close enough to a secret government installation as he is legally allowed and then took a picture. So, he, you know, nothing he's doing here is illegal. He's just zooming in his camera as far as it'll go and um, making out this sort of building or, you know, this facility that um, is way in the distance that you can't see. You, you're, you're, you know, this is a much clearer picture than you would be able to see with the naked eye. Um, so... Uh, mostly I've talked about it with the earlier photography, the, um, the film like type of photography, not the digital type of photography, the digital revolution, um, where the chemical photographic negative began to go out of style, um, in then translating information from lens to digital files became more popular. And also we just, you know, developed the technology to do so. Film photography is still sort of like a niche thing today that photographers, um, like, and there are qualities to it that are, you know, feel very authentic. It's kind of the difference between, um, you know, having a record player and having a, um, you know, the photos on your DSLR, um, or sorry, having a record player and playing off of like the radio in your car. Um, you know, it's, it's going to sound a little bit different. It's going to have some like different kind of quirks to it. Um, and same with photography. Um, translating. So once we start translating information from the lens into digital files, though, um, we notice that we can alter easily through photo manipulation software. And so the vehicle of truth no longer holds up the way that it used to. Um, also, the specialness of photographs is really reduced as well. Um, whereas before, you know, any photograph was, you know, considered to be very precious and um, took a lot of time and energy. But today, you know, anybody, whether it is a you know professional photographer trained for 10 years um, by the masters can take a photograph. And so can your two year old nephew that has your iPhone for a few minutes. So, um, you know, it's and that's special in its own way. But it's um, sort of the the um, exclusivity of photography was reduced. So um, going back to that idea of uh, the being the vehicle of truth sort of not holding up, Jeff Wall is really interested in that type of photography. Um, he creates digital photographs and then manipulates them and overlaps them and, you know, creates different layers to make things feel um, really real. Um, yeah, it's staged photographs. It's not um, it's not actually what's happening. So um this is also the pictures are blown up to like as big as they can possibly be. So you can kind of examine yourself um, for any like, you know, editing to be done. And he's really, really clean about it. It makes it seem like there's, you know, there's nothing wrong here. Um, this is boy falls from a tree. It seems um, like this is happening from real life, but it's actually just a combination of images, but probably wouldn't, you know, wouldn't think about that. It looks like this is just a boy falling from a tree, but actually this is a, boy that's probably just laying on the ground in this position and he's been you know photoshopped to look like he's coming out of the tree the digital revolution um D james well or sorry i don't know why i said that again <laughs> um james welling is another photographer who 
Um, instead of trying to, uh, you know, make things seem really smooth and natural the way that Jeff Wall does, he uh, explicitly maximizes the editing potential of software. Um, he began his career using film, but embraced new technology later on. This is his piece, uh, 9812. It's a series of layered photos um, from modern dance companies, landscapes, government buildings. And he essentially just imagine you're on Instagram and you just, um, you're posting a picture and you just, you know, maximize all the different editing options. And on top of that, you put it in Photoshop and can just stretch things and pull things in a way that is totally unnatural. Um, and that's, that's kind of what his art is about is just kind of like maximizing those effects. So that is the end of lesson 11. Um, we will jump back in on lesson 12, which is, um, I think I actually have craft and sculpture um, switched for this one. So lesson 12 will be sculpture, not craft. And then lesson 13 will be craft. Um, but I will see you then.